from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning. I'm Michelle Catteray Bradley, a research specialist in the Science, Technology, and Business Division of the Library of Congress. This is the 10th season of our collaboration with NASA Goddard, and today is the second lecture in the eighth that we have planned for this season. There is a list available outside the theater, and you can always check our website to see what's coming up. The 2014 movie Interstellar has a team of astronauts set out to explore a system of planets orbiting a supermassive spinning black hole named Gargantua, searching for a world that may be conducive to hosting human life. With theoretical physicist Kip Thorne as a science advisor, the film has been praised for its high level of scientific accuracy. But what is science and what is Hollywood? This presentation will address the habitability zone around supermassive black holes and will discuss the Hollywood movie in light of the physics governing accretion, relativity, and astrobiology. I'm very excited to present Dr. Jeremy Schnittman, a research astrophysicist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. He has a doctorate in physics from MIT and his research interests include theoretical and computational modeling of black hole accretion flows, black hole binaries, and other things that I cannot pronounce at this time. <laughs> Please welcome Dr. Jeremy Schnittman. Thank you so much for that introduction. That's great. It's great to be here. Um, it's really fun. Um, love talking about black holes so uh this is is really you guys are doing me a favor to let me come and just go on and on and on about my uh well it's not just my hobby it's it's actually my job which is a pretty exciting place to be uh so i will be talking about the science of interstellar the movie um you know there's a, a tendency especially physicists to to watch science fiction movies and try to pick apart every single little hole in the plot or well we, we used to call it at MIT the the well actually effect right because you said well, well 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 actually you know that wouldn't really happen that way so I'm going to really try to avoid that approach because of my great uh, enjoyment of the movie and my great respect for Kip Thorne who is uh, you know the the heart and mind and soul behind the movie so rather than think of this really as a as a critique or a commentary on the movie, I like to think of it more as uh, uh, kind of like a tribute band to the Beatles. To you know, every, they they can do things a little bit their own way, but really the the uh, the heart and soul of it is uh, is coming from Kip Thorne. So you saw it maybe out in the cart outside, but I brought my own copy, right? So if anything more you want to to learn about uh, the science of interstellar that I don't cover in the talk is really well laid out in, in Kip's recent books. Some of us actually think that he got Hollywood to make the movie to help sell the book. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's, it's really a, a great uh, introduction. If you like that, uh, a somewhat more technical book, but still basically a, a popular science book, and, and I would say my all-time favorite popular science book is Kip's book from uh, about black holes and time warps, which is about black holes, gravitational waves, time travel. And then if you're really in, in for the, uh, the heavy duty lifting, literally and mentally, right, is what we, what we call the Bible, gravitation by, by uh, Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler. Kip also his, his magnum opus. Got my uh, signed copy from Kip. Okay, so uh, in addition to, to acknowledging um, Kip's tremendous contribution to the, to the field and in, in the, this movie in, in particular, I also want to give uh, credit to my, my boss, 
astronaut Pierre Sellers, who is uh, both a, an astronaut, a scientist, and a, a construction worker. Uh, he built the International Space Station. Um, so, so Pierce is an, is an Earth scientist by training, and uh, he's also been a tremendous advocate and supporter of, uh, of a lot of the, the work that I do and that I'll be talking about today, in particular, the intersection of Earth science, climate, exoplanets, and astrophysics, which is one of the great things about NASA Goddard, is that we have all these different disciplines all working together and learning from each other. Uh, this is a, an older picture of, of Kip. I, I just noticed this morning, you see he, he's got the, uh, the Tesla medallion there upside down, but clearly a man ahead of his time. Um, more recently, he's, he's been named the, one of the 100 most influential uh, people by Time Magazine. It's a great little blurb actually written by Christopher Nolan. So he's really become a, uh, a rock star. In fact, we just learned this morning that uh, Kip and his, his collaborators at LIGO, the gravitational wave detector, have been awarded uh, the uh, break, Breakthrough Foundation, I think it's called the Foundation Prize in physics, essentially a no Nobel scale $3 million prize for their discovery of gravitational waves. And then here's a picture from this weekend with, uh, with Pierce and uh, another Hollywood personality who came to visit, uh, who came to Leonardo DiCaprio, for those of you like me. Um, <laughs> and came, came to visit Goddard this weekend to, uh, to learn about some of the, the research we're doing there on climate. Um, so let's, uh, you know, we're going to cover a lot of different uh, topics today, uh, climate, black holes, gravitational waves, particle physics, exoplanets. Um, here's a, a, just a, a good primer on, imagine some of you have, have heard over the last 20 years, we've discovered over 2,000 planets orbiting stars outside of our solar system, extrasolar planets or exoplanets. And here's uh, a plot of just uh, some of the properties of, of those planets, and it's also a good opportunity to introduce, just so to make sure that we're somewhat all on the same page, the concept of a, of a what we call a log-log plot, right? You see the, the x-axis is units of semi-major axis, the distance of a planet from its star in these uh, kind of archaic units we call astronomical units. Not very descriptive, but an astronomical unit is a unit of distance one astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So there's one astronomical unit. So all of the planets on this side are closer to their stars than the Earth is to the Sun. And then here's the, the planet's mass, where at scaled relative to the Earth. So there's one Earth mass, 10 Earth masses. And you see that these, what we call these log-log plots, they're, they're spacing increases as you go to the right or as you go up. And it's very useful for physicists to use these because we can uh, cover many, many orders of different scales on a single plot. So, you know, these planets are 10 times heavier than these and 10 times heavier than these, etc. cetera. Uh, Jupiter is up here about 1,000 times the size of the Earth. So you, we have this big clump of planets up here, what we call hot Jupiters, very massive planets orbiting very close to their host stars. And then you see a whole bunch of planets down here, which are now called this, this uh, growing class of planets discovered by the Kepler mission, are called sub-Neptunes. So they're basically between the size of Neptune and Earth. There's no analog in our own solar system, but it turns out these are some of the most common planets in the entire galaxy, and a lot of them orbit very close to their host star. Now you see there's really nothing else quite like Earth. Now that's not really true, it's just we haven't found anything else quite like Earth yet because these planets that orbit very close to their stars are much easier to see for two reasons. One, because we use this one technique that looks for the wobble. You've probably heard of this, right? You look at the wobble of the star as it's getting pulled by its planet. And another uh, technique is you actually look for a little shadow as the, as the planet passes in front of the star decreasing 
the light from the star by even a fraction of a percent. So both of those techniques are much easier to use when the star, when the planet is very close to the star. So that's why we kind of have this tendency to f discover a lot more planets that are close to the stars or these ones that are far away but very massive, so cause a very big pull on the star. So really it's just a question of time until we push this plot down to the right to discover the true Earth-like uh, planet. In fact, another fortuitous event in the news that I just saw yesterday was a new, new planetary system discovered um, by a European group with a, just a relatively small telescope, about a two-foot telescope down in Chile. They found what now they claim, which is kind of the new claim every four months or so, the most Earth-like exoplanet has yet again been discovered, a system of three planets. They're orbiting so close to their star that it only takes two days for the planet to go all the way around the star, a two-day year. But even so, the star that they're going around is so small and so dim that it actually could be habitable. It, won't, it wouldn't be that hot on this planet, even though it's only in a two-day orbit. So those are the guys down here, so about one Earth mass, but much closer to their host star. And yet what, what I've put in here uh, with the color scale is the, is the temperature of the star, right? Smaller stars are cooler, so you can basically afford to get closer to them without getting burnt up. So this, even though they're not really like Earth and, and life on these planets could be very different, it could at least be possible. Um, so this is really the, uh, the exciting direction that the study of exoplanets is going now. So what do you, let's get a little bit more into details about that idea of, of the habitable zone. What makes a planet habitable? So we start off by, by saying that we want it to have liquid water on the surface of the planet. Now, we know that you know, we're somewhat limited by our imagination as how, to, how life works on Earth. There's water. It's on the surface. It seems to be an important part of life. Um, it's not simply that we're limiting our imagination by requiring liquid water on the surface. Um, there are you know, moons of Jupiter that now we believe have liquid water under two kilometers of solid ice and could very well actually host life. But if you want to see that life with a telescope from 20 light years away, it really helps for it to actually be on the surface and interacting with the atmosphere, so, you know, leaking out methane into the atmosphere for us to detect with our telescopes and spectrometers. So, for, 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 the, for those purposes, we're going to use as our working definition of what we call the habitable zone is any planet that has enough energy coming from its host star so that the surface temperature of the planet will be between freezing and boiling. Um, and also, since we want it on a surface, we're going to throw out planets like Neptune and Jupiter, which are just giant balls of gas because they don't really have a surface. So um, if you want, you know, little creepy crawly things to crawl out of the ocean onto the shore, you better have an ocean and you better have a shore. So we're going to focus for the rest of the talk really on, on rocky planets, kind of Earth, Mars, Venus type of planets. And they're going, we, we want to see which of these planets are in this habitable zone, sometimes called the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, so that all the water would, would literally boil off the planet and escape into, into space. And not too cold, where everything would just freeze over. So here's another one of those log-log plots, where again, we're plotting the distance from the star on the bottom. But instead of the planet's mass, now we're plotting the mass of the star that the planet is going around. So here's one, rel you know, so it's relative to the sun. So the, the, this is the sun, and then here are the, these little dots are, are the, uh, the solar system planets, right? Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Um, and this yellow band is what we call the habitable zone. And, you know, fortunately, Earth is indeed in the habitable zone, so we can live here. Uh, you notice that Venus is a little bit inside, a little closer to the sun than the habitable zone, and Mars is a little bit outside of the habitable zone. And that is, you know, should be familiar, right? We know that Venus is really too hot to s support life. And at least today, Mars seems to be too cold to support life. Although we also know that in, in an earlier time, it may have supported life either through 
a, uh, a thicker atmosphere or a different composition of the atmosphere. So that's kind of not included entirely in, in this, you know, it's kind of a, an, an extra dimension to this plot, but it does go into the calculation of kind of the, again, the, the typical habitable zone for a planet like Earth. You have to include all those, it's the, the atmosphere is actually very important. It's not just what the star is doing, but it's what the atmosphere is doing, right? What we all know very well, the, the greenhouse effect makes planets, for example, like Mars, much warmer than they might have otherwise been because the radiation coming from the star gets absorbed by the atmosphere and kind of trapped and it warms up the planet a little bit, uh, a little bit hotter than it, it should have or it otherwise would have been. Um, so all of these calculations, oh, one, one more thing, right? We mentioned the, the, the mass of the stars on the left here. And you see that as you go to smaller stars, like I mentioned earlier, the, the stars get fainter and, and uh, cooler. So you're getting less radiation from that star. And therefore, the habitable zone moves closer and closer to the star because you have to, in order to get enough energy from the star, you just have to move that, that planet closer and closer. Now, this dotted line here is kind of another interesting feature which is what we call the tidal locking radius. And again, you're probably familiar with this, if you, even if you don't know it, anyone who's ever looked at the moon and noticed that the same side of the moon always faces the Earth, right? And the reason is because the force of the tide between the Earth and the moon has slowed down the rotation of the moon to the point where it's, it's locked. It rotates at the same time that it orbits the, uh, the Earth. And we know that any planets that are close enough to their stars, anything inside this dotted line is going to have the exact same effect. In fact, have the same side of the um, same side of the planet always facing the star. Some people say that it means that a day is the same as a year, but that's actually not quite right because there's no such thing as a day. If you're always facing the sun, you may have a year, but you don't have a day. It's kind of odd to think about, but. Um, so when you get to those kind of planets, actually there's another important effect, right? Um, that if you're always facing the same side of the, the planet is always facing the star, well, that side's gonna get a lot hotter and the other side's gonna get a whole lot colder. So again, we, we have a situation where the atmosphere plays a very, very important role in the habitability of the planet. You need to use the atmosphere essentially to move that heat around. I mean, fortunately, you know, on Earth, you don't, it gets cooler, but it doesn't free, the, the entire planet doesn't freeze at night because we store up some of that warmth in the atmosphere. So as the, as you know, those 12 hours of darkness, the, the atmosphere is cooling down, but not enough to actually freeze us up. So we think the same happens with these planets down here that are so close to their star, like the ones that we just discovered um, with those two day years. Um, they're always going to be facing the same side of the planet to the uh, to the star. Now, this has an important effect on the climate too, because um, because of clouds. Now, I imagine some of you have flown in an airplane before. You look out the window, you look down, and if any of you have ever flown over the ocean, sometimes you look down and you see the ocean. Sometimes you look down and you see the clouds. Now, the clouds are white, and the ocean is blue or dark blue, right? Well, it turns out that actually makes a really big difference on the, the weather and the climate of the planet is whether, you're, whether you have clouds, or whether you have ocean, or whether you have desert, or whether you have forest, all of those actually look very different to the, to the star. So that light coming from the star is going to either just reflect off the planet if it hits a cloud, because clouds are white, they, they're really good at reflecting. Um, or if it hits the ocean, it'll be absorbed and turned into heat. So uh, this, this group out of the University of Chicago recently wrote this paper that showed that if you go from a, what we think of like an Earth-like planet, a simplified model, but an Earth-like planet nonetheless, this is, the, um, this is a kind of a map of the globe where the color is, is the, cloud, the, the fraction of clouds. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> giving me a reminder to give this talk. Um, so you see at the 
at the tropics around the equator, there's a lot of clouds, right? This is where you get the, the rainforest. There's a lot of rain, there's a lot of clouds. And then at you know plus or minus 20, 30 degrees latitude, you have these uh, very dry desert-like regions. And the reason is because of these circulation models um, in the planet, as the, the moisture rises up at the equator from getting heated by the sun, and then it rises, cools, turns into clouds, and rains. Then you have these large circulations where it's the, uh, the circulation models where the air goes up, moves up to the different latitudes, and then comes down in these, uh, what they call the Hadley cells of, um, of atmospheric uh, circulation. And those, since they're coming from way up high where there's not a lot of moisture, they come down over the deserts and there's no, there's no moisture to rain out. So that's why the deserts are dry and the tropics are wet. Now, because the, the Earth is rotating relatively fast once a day, the, uh, these clouds and weather patterns basically get just spun around the Earth and all averaged out. Going from here over to here, basically just take the planet and stop it and do those, that tidal locking where you're always facing the same side of the planet facing the sun. And you see a completely different ef effect. You have one giant cloud facing the star because you have this one part of the planet that's getting heated the water comes up out of the oceans goes to, to the higher uh, altitude cools off forms giant clouds and rains back down you're fe essentially putting up a parasol blocking the planet from sun from any more uh, from any more sunlight and that allows us to go from here this this amount of energy you're getting from the sun, which is from, for our, from Earth, is 1,365 watts per meter squared, you can more than double the amount of energy that you're pumping into the planet, and you just build up a bigger cloud, you build a bigger sun umbrella, and it actually still remains habitable, whereas if it were rotating, you wouldn't get that effect, and, it, and you wouldn't uh, be able to protect yourself from the sun. So that was basically a long-winded way of saying that when you're tidally locked to your to your uh, to your host star, you can afford to get a lot closer to it and not boil off your oceans and still be habitable. Um, for the for basically for the rest of the talk, we're going to condense all of that information into into two numbers, which is just the amount of flux hitting on average. You know, some some part of the planet has to be between these two numbers: 120 and 750 watts per meter squared. You don't have to remember those. Just remember that if, since most of the stuff we're going to be talking about with black holes, we're going to be talking about energy coming from the black hole or from the environments onto the planet, and we're going to assume that somehow the planet finds a way of of converting that energy into you know, kind of nice room temperature heat, and it's going to be able to do so within, within this range. So that's what we're going to use as our working definition of the habitable zone for the rest of this talk, between 120 and 750 watts. Okay, now, now we have to figure out how, what does this have to do, what does this have to do with black holes? Um, I imagine some of you have seen the movie, um, some of you may have not. If you came to the talk, you had to kind of assume you were going to have at least a couple spoilers. So here we go. Okay, so again, remember what I said at the beginning? We're not going to pick about every little plot hole in the movie. <laughs> but the basic thing is, right, we got a wormhole out at Saturn. We're going to go through the wormhole to another galaxy and explore these three planets orbiting around a black hole in the other galaxy and look for which one is most promising to support the human race. Now, some of the, you know, some of these may be stretches, but um, what I like about this this whole scene and this approach is it actually very closely resembles NASA's official policy for exoplanet exploration. Now, we don't have an underground secret facility that I can tell you about, um, <laughs> but. But we, this, it's essentially this idea of triage, right? So when you want to explore uh, a large number of systems with a limited number of resources, 
you do this multiple cuts, right? So, for example, right now we're developing at Goddard this mission called TESS, the Transiting Exoplanets System Explorer. I don't know what the other S is. The second S is for savings. Um, <laughs> and it is because it, the, the mission TESS is, TESS is a very sh small, very quick, relatively cheap mission that's going to go up and just look for these little shadows of planets moving in front of the stars at, say, the closest 100,000 stars to the Earth. Um, and he's just going to look at each one for, you know, 15 minutes and then come back and look at it for 15 minutes again. Um, and in doing so, it'll, it'll identify specific targets that then we're going to use the next really big mission from NASA, the James Webb Space Telescope, is going to then focus its huge mirror and spectrograph at those planets to get much better data. Now, it can take hundreds and hundreds of hours of staring at a single star to get enough data to even measure a single uh, absorption feature in the atmosphere. Um, so that's why you have to use something like TESS to find the good candidates for something like the James Webb Space Telescope. It's really a, a very reasonable way to allocate your resources. And then ultimately, as, as they show in the movie, right, there's really no excuse uh, or no substitute for in situ measurements, to actually go to the planet, get down there, take atmospheric measurements, take soil samples, um, which we are doing in our own so solar system, if not yet other solar systems. So that's the basic idea is they have to um, explore the, the properties of these three planets orbiting around a supermassive black hole. Now, I'm going to go through you know, the, the rest of the talk. We're going to kind of explore maybe some additional information they could have used in narrowing down their choices of which are the most promising of those three planets. Um, but at the end of the day, again, we really are limited by our own imagination right now. So we're thinking of, well, what would an Earth-like planet look like if you suddenly put it into orbit around a black hole? Now, in reality, anything orbiting around a black hole probably is nothing like an Earth-like planet. Instead of water, they might have, you know, liquid lead oceans and yet still be perfectly comfortable for whatever creatures they have there. But at least from the point of view of trying to look for a, an Earth-type planet around a supermassive black hole, we'll use what, what we know about uh, Earth climate and uh, the type of habitable, habitability defined by liquid water. Um, so remember this plot with that little dotted line about tidally locked planets? Um, so now I've scaled up the, the mass instead of the star. Now it's going to be the mass of the black hole that this planet is orbiting. Um, so you see these are now, again, these, uh, for again, anyone who's not entirely comfortable with scientific notation, 10 to the 8, that's how you read that number, 10 to the 8, or it is simply 1 followed by 8 zeros, so 100 million times the size of the sun. That's kind of the, the uh, prototypical size of what we call a supermassive black hole. And as Kip outlines in his book, that's really the target mass he had in mind for the, the um, for Gargantua, the black hole in the movie. So that's really the the number we're thinking about, which means that any planet within about 200 astronomical units would all be tidally locked. The gravity is so strong it would essentially lock the entire solar system as we know it would be locked into uh, that rotational fixing, so that it's always going to to face the same size same side is going to face the black hole. So I think we're pretty safe in using that um, assumption of that potential huge cloud deck to help protect us from excessive radiation. Um, there's a good time to introduce a, a, I think this may be the, the only equation in the entire talk, which is something called a gravitational radius, right? It's uh, also a unit of length. And conveniently enough, for a 10, or for, sorry, 100 million solar mass black hole, one gravitational radius is exactly the same as one astronomical unit. So you don't even really have to think of any new uh, units or equations. Um, so this is simply the, the uh, Newton's gravitational constant times the mass of the black hole divided by the speed of light square. Uh, another convenient 
uh, feature of this equation is that it, for most black holes, this is the, uh, the, the size of the black hole in that this is the radius of the event horizon. So down here at one gravitational radius is the event horizon. Out here at 100 gravitational radii, that's essentially 100 times further away from the black hole. So th these are the units that we're going to use for the rest of the talk, all scaled in as a, as a fraction of the size of the black hole, as a fraction of the, the event horizon. And again, at pretty much everything we're going to be looking at is going to be inside of that tidal locking radius. So, so we've, got, uh, we've got the mass, we've got the, uh, the tidally locked. Now we have to figure out how to replace this axis with what we had before for the stars was how much energy are you actually getting out of the black hole, right? Black holes are black. Well, not exactly, right? Black holes are actually really, really, really bright. And the reason is because most black holes that we can see, that we can measure, of course, a strong selection effect is the, the ones that are bright, the ones that have gas orbiting around them in something called an accretion disk. So here's a little artist's impression of, of gas going around a black hole. Um, you see that basically it looks almost like a planetary system. Everything's going around in a nice flat plane on, on nice circular orbits. Um, and you can kind of see from the, again, the artist's impression that the accretion disk gets brighter and brighter as it gets closer to the black hole. The gas, as it gets pulled in to the black hole, it gets heated up hotter and hotter. So it becomes brighter and brighter, just like hotter stars are brighter than cooler stars. So this is the, uh, this is the artist's impression. Here's the astrophysicist's impression and the more or less the, the same picture that they used in the movie promotion. Uh, except this was the one that I made on my computer. Uh, here's the, the turbulent gas moving around on these orbits in the accretion disk around the black hole. Uh, the, we're looking at the accretion disk almost edge on, uh, so it should look like a flattened pancake, but because of the super strong gravity of the black hole, the light actually gets warped by what we call gravitational lensing, so this huge arc in the back is actually, we're zooming in here, is actually photons, light from the far side of the black hole that get bent by the gr black hole's gravity up into this arc above and below. You also see the light coming, gets bent from below. Um, this inner circle here is even cooler because this is light that goes around the black hole an entire time and then hits the accretion disk or then escapes out to the observer. So you see these characteristic light rings around black holes, and that's due to the extreme gravitational warping of space-time around the black hole. Here is a, is a plot of, again, another one of these log-log plots. Now we're plotting the distance from, this is essentially the distance from the, the horizon, the distance from the edge of the black hole. You can see we go very, very close to the black hole, a hundredth of a gravitational radius away from the horizon. And on the y-axis, this is the, the temperature of an accretion disk. So you see that the accretion disk, as it goes closer and closer to the black hole, it gets hotter and hotter, but then it turns over and goes down to zero. Uh, all these different curves have to do with different black hole spins, right? Just like planets spin, stars spin, we believe that black holes spin, but when a black hole spins, when it or, you know, rotates, it drags the fabric of space-time along with it, pulling everything along in its wake. So this gas can get closer and closer and closer without falling into the black hole yet. This blue curve here is for a black hole that doesn't spin. The, the gas goes in, it gets to a certain point, and then just fall, plunges down the drain. As you go to higher and higher spins, the, the gas gets closer and closer and closer to the black hole, it gets hotter and hotter, closer and closer to the event horizon. So for, and, and we measure the spin basically is just a number between zero and one. Zero is no spin, one is the, the maximum allowed by Einstein's theory of relativity. So up here is, is a uh, maximally spinning black hole and that the, the gargantua in the movie is also considered to be just about 
maximally spinning. And you see, so the temperature goes up to actually almost 200,000 degrees of the accretion disk as it gets uh, heated up just about to fall into the black hole. Now, our sun in is uh, it's about 5,700 degrees. So let's, let's call it 6,000 degrees. Now that's in, in Kelvin or centigrade. It's just about the same. Um, so our sun, which is you know very far away at 6,000 degrees is enough to keep us warm. So what do you think it would be like if you were right outside of the event horizon with an accretion disk surrounding you 200,000 degrees? Well, your planet would be then 200,000 degrees, a little bit too hot to support life. So what we need to do is essentially dial that temperature way down to the, the few hundred degrees. Room temperature, let's say, is 300 degrees Kelvin. So we want to dial this temperature down from 200,000 degrees to 300 degrees. And that's, there actually is a very simple way to do that, is you just dial down the amount of gas in the accretion disk. If you put less gas piling into the black hole, it essentially cools off because there's less energy to turn into uh, radiation. So we're just going to dial that, uh, that accretion rate, that gas, way down until we get something that is a little bit more uh, habitable and looks a little bit more like this, the sun. Um, so there's Miller's planet. It's the one that's orbiting very, very close to Gargantua. And you saw from the, from the visuals, right, the, uh, let's just take another quick, you know, it's, it's Hollywood, but if, if you want to really, you know, pull the, pull the um actually approach to this movie, right, you see that it looks kind of like the sun, right? It's yellowish, white, you know, we can see it with our eyes. If it were 200,000 degrees, it would be blasting us with UV radiation but it looks more or less like the sun in all the visuals. So, you know, Kip talks about it in the book, and we're going to infer from that that the temperature of the accretion disk is comparable to the temperature of the sun, let's say five or 6,000 degrees. So in order to do that, what you need to do is dial that accretion disk way, that accretion rate way down from let's call it one, unit of one is kind of the maximum accretion rate, down to 12, 10 to the tw 12 times less accretion rate is what you need to get the temperature down to where a, uh, a, a planet could be habitable. So the way that you, you read this kind of graph is there's kind of two ways to do it. You could say, well, let's say the accretion weight rate is uh, 10 billion times less than maximum. Then where's the habitable zone? You have to go out here and you see the habitable zone is right around 10 gravitational radii. To get down to uh, the temperature of the sun, it turns out you need an accretion rate of 10 to the minus seven. So that's up here. And the habitable zone would be out here at about uh, 100 gravitational radii. So you know, not, we're not cri critiquing, but we're exploring. Right, Miller's planet is down here, right outside of the black hole. It is so far inside of the habitable zone that the, the temperature on the planet would essentially be uh, thousands and thousands of degrees, which if you can see the accretion disk, you would have already known that. Um, so the, the only, you know, if it, the accretion disk looks like the sun way up here, then you only want to look for planets that are out in that habitable zone, hundreds of gravitational radii away. Um, this is, well, we can skip, this is just a slight detail. Um, the problem is, the only way that you could actually dial that radiation, that, that accretion rate down to these temperatures, um, it turns out that the disk would be so thin, so, uh, so the, the amount of gas in the disk would be so little, it would cease to be a disk altogether. In fact, that's exactly what we see of the, the black hole in the center of our own galaxy, Sagittarius A star is a supermassive black hole in the center of the Milky Way, and it looks nothing at all like gargantuan. It doesn't have an accretion disk. It doesn't have this nice uh, increasing temperature. It just has a big blob of hot gas that we can see with the, the Chandra 
uh, X-ray telescope in its very low density but very hot gas just kind of free falling onto the black hole. You don't see these nice thin disks. Um, so, okay, so let's say, let's get rid of the, the accretion disk picture altogether and now we'll say, well, the heat source is coming from this gas just kind of free falling into the black hole. Now the problem is the planet's going on a nice circular orbit around the black hole. So if you're in an accretion disk, you're going along with the accretion disk on these nice circular orbits and you know all that matters is the light that you're getting from the accretion disk. But if you're going on a circular orbit around the black hole and all this gas around you is just free falling down, um, what's going to happen? You're actually going to smash into the gas because this one's going this way, you're going that way, and you smash into the gas. Um, the, and gas falling into a black hole, as it gets closer and closer to the black hole, it goes faster and faster until essentially it's going the speed of light. So you're going to have this planet getting sandblasted by the surrounding gas hitting it at nearly the speed of light. But, okay, we can do that. We remember we said we assume the atmosphere has a way of recirculating the energy. All we care about is what's the total amount of energy getting absorbed by the planet. Well, this is what it looks like. You just have to dial that accretion rate way, 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 way down because, again, as you get closer and closer to the black hole, that, that gas falling in is going faster and faster. So you just have to dial down the accretion rate. You get less and less gas going faster and faster, and that's the, uh, that gives you the, uh, the amount of gas that would still allow the planet to be habitable, essentially off the charts. Um, Okay, so let's assume that since they were able to build a wormhole, this advanced civilization has found a way to get rid of all that gas around the black hole to kind of solve it entirely from, from destroying the planet. Well, there's yet another problem we have to worry about. Okay, so this is, this is essentially the, I would say, the most important point of the entire talk it's because it's, it's the one thing that I came up with. That's not in the Kip Thorne book. It's, <laughs> right, it's, it's this plot right here, right? Um, as you get closer and closer to the black hole, time slows down, right? We, we, know, we all know that Einstein says that gravity can warp space and time. So as you get closer and closer to the black hole, like, uh, like Romley just said, you know, relativity tells us that time slows down. So they also said that one hour is equal to seven years, right? That's one hour is equal to 60,000 hours in seven years. So you have this time dilation effect of a factor of 60,000, right? That's way over here. So to get that effect, you are essentially forced to put Miller's planet so close to the event horizon, you know, 0 0.00004 gravitational radii away from the event horizon that in order to get that extreme um, time dilation effect. So, okay, let's, you know, let's work with this. What, what then happens when you want to, say, talk on, your ra on the radio, right? You're going on your little landing ship down onto the planet. You left the mothership behind far away, and you're, you're talking back and forth on the radio. Or let's say you're Let's say you're doing Morse code with a, uh, a laser pointer, right? So I'm, I'm, let's say I'm on the planet, right? And I'm talking back to the, the ship and I'm sending a, a little blip every second. Said that that blip on, from the point of view of the ship far away from the planet, it's only gonna get one blip every 60,000 seconds, right? Well, let's turn it around the other way. Let's say you're on the ship sending a little Morse code to the people on, on the planet. You're sending a little blip every second. They're getting 60,000 blips a second, brrr, you know, right on, right on top of their heads. Um, and if it's a laser pointer, the, the, there's a much bigger problem, right? That a laser, what, right, what is a laser? It's a perfectly coherent wave, uh, uh, radio wave or you know electromagnetic wave that has exact perfectly consistent frequency. A frequency of a laser is actually just like a clock. So this this laser is actually hitting the screen 
just like Morse code, but hitting it, you know, 10 to the 15 times per second with the little, uh, you know, uh, photon wave. Now you multiply that also has to get multiplied by 60,000. So from the point of view of a laser, that's what we call redshift or blue shift. So now instead of a laser hitting the people uh, on, on the planet, you're essentially hitting them with an x-ray death beam. <laughs> okay? So, be, and that's all completely uh, inseparable from this idea of time dilation. If you're going to have that factor of 60,000 time dilation, and Christopher Nolan absolutely demanded it for the plot, right? He told Kip, says, nope, that's, that's non-negotiable. Then you're going to have also all the, the radiation hitting that planet is going to be 60,000 times more energetic than it was emitted by. Okay, let's work with this. Just don't shine a laser pointer on the guys, okay? Right? Problem solved. No. Well, turns out the entire universe is a giant laser pointer, right? Has anyone ever seen this picture? This is the cosmic microwave background. Very, very low frequency radio waves that permeate the entire universe, right? And it's got these little fluctuations because some spots in the sky are a little warmer than others. But you basically have an entire sky is radio waves at very, very low temperature, two degrees above absolute zero. Well, let's see what this would look like from the point of view of a planet or a spaceship orbiting a black hole. As you get closer to the black hole, okay, so there's the black hole, there's the gravitational lensing, but now you're seeing a, a asymmetry between the front and the back. And this is a, uh, I have to kind of step away from the mic right there. This is, this is essentially an all-sky map. So picture yourself on a space station, on a spaceship like this, where the black hole is on your left, and in front of you is this area here. To your right is projected this area, and this area here is, is behind you, right? That's how this kind of this projection works. As you get closer and closer to the black hole, you're moving faster and faster orbiting around it. The black hole shadow gets bigger, right? Now we're at five gravitational radii, and this patch of radiation in front of you is getting hotter and hotter. Now it's up to a whopping four degrees above absolute zero. Get even closer, the black hole essentially takes up half of the sky, right? The black hole is that entire area to the left of you, and right in front of you is all of the entire cosmic radiation of the universe squeezed into a single point and hitting you at a, a blue shifted frequency. Now, frequency and temperature are actually the same thing. So as we go zooming closer and closer and closer, now we're up to 15 degrees, but you get to the point where your time dilation, your, your blue shift is a factor of 60,000, you get the, the background radiation temperature goes from two degrees to 120,000 degrees, beaming at you right in the face with this huge uh, ultraviolet flux. Again, not so good for habitability. So here's a, a, a plot as, you know, as you get closer and closer to the, the black hole. Here's just the total flux that you're getting from the CMB coming at, at you. And here's the little band of, of habitability. So Miller's planet's way up here, about 100 times more flux than you could possibly survive. And that's just from the, the cosmic microwave background. But okay, so you back it away a little bit and you're, you're good to go. Well, not quite, right? Remember that was our picture of the, the center of our galaxy? Well, it turns out also in the center of the galaxy, in addition to all that uh, gas, there are a lot of stars. In fact, if you were to live in the center of the Milky Way, the night sky would be 100,000 times brighter. You could read at night from starlight, just because there's so many more stars packed into a small region. So now instead of just worrying about the cosmic microwave background, you, need, you have all these stars just everywhere surrounding you, all getting blue shifted and raining down on you. So that gives you the flux from the starlight is actually much higher. So you have to push your planet even further away from the black hole to still survive. Okay, we've got very advanced civilization. We'll just build a giant Dyson sphere around the planet, which is these 
another famous idea in science fiction where you essentially build a giant metal sphere around a star or a planet that can either absorb light or reflect all the light. Okay, so all that uh, cosmic radiation coming in from outside, getting blue shifted by the black hole, we'll just build like a giant mirror disco ball and just reflect it all out, and our planet will nestle inside nice, safe, and sound. Neutrinos. Neutrinos can go through anything. They, you know, 10 billion just went through my thumbnail. They're everywhere. Now, fortunately for us, neutrinos basically just could care less about us. They just right through us. But if you get enough of them, they start to deposit energy. And just like there's the cosmic microwave background, there's also a cosmic neutrino background. The universe is just filled with neutrinos. Um, but because they more or less go right through you, you have to get really close. Let's say 10 to the minus 11 radii away from the horizon to get enough neutrino flux lighting up the atmosphere in order to, to get that habitability zone. Um, but let's say the neutrinos don't just abs get absorbed in the atmosphere. The neutrinos could also get absorbed in the core of the Earth, the core of the planet, and then heat it up with radiation. And then you essentially you have geothermal heating of the planet from neutrinos. Yes, NASA does actually pay me to think about these things, <laughs> right? And that moves it way out because you get a lot more uh, cross-section, a lot more opportunity to get heated by the neutrinos. Um, and then we can actually push it out even further because these are the, the C neutrino background, the cosmic neutrino background. It turns out actually most of the neutrinos going through me right now are not coming from the distant universe, but they're coming from the sun, right? The sun generating neutrinos in its core, in its core nuclear reactor all the time. So when you use those neutrinos instead, it actually goes much, you know, there's a lot more flux. You have to push it way out. Um, and then you have to push it out even further because, remember, now we're in the, galactic, in the center of the galaxy where there are tons of stars, tons of neutrinos, and you're pushed out. So far, you're basically back out to the same radius that you were for the cosmic microwave background radiation. So even with your Dyson sphere, the neutrinos are still going to, to heat up your planet above uh, any habitability zone. Um, let's say again. We've got super advanced civilization. We can build a Dyson sphere. We can even build a neutrino Dyson sphere, just, you know, a kilometer of lead around the entire planet to, to protect it from, from neutrinos. There's dark matter. I just like this movie. It's a movie I made a simulation of dark matter particles orbiting around a black hole. And there's just dark matter everywhere in the universe. And we don't know anything about it except that it reacts to gravity. And we know that black holes have a whole heck of a lot of gravity. So we know that dark matter is going to all get pulled in towards black holes. And when it's a spinning black hole like Gargantuan, it actually wraps the dark matter around it. And it almost looks like a, a ball of yarn as these particles get pulled around the black hole from the twisting and warping of space-time and that you put a planet down in the middle of that and you're just going to get completely bombarded by dark matter now since we don't actually know anything about dark matter i couldn't make a plot because i don't know actually how dark matter will affect the planet but i imagine it's going to be bad <laughs> this is our last source of death on a planet around a black hole gravitational waves right today like we said, it's celebrated uh, with $3 million, Kip Thorne's discovery of gravitational waves with LIGO. I don't know if any of you have seen this movie. This is from the press conference at NSF earlier this year. That's These are two different filters on the gravitational wave. But that was it, that little whoop, right? That was three times the size of the sun E equals mc squared being turned pure into pure energy in about 20 milliseconds. All right? It's gonna have you're gonna have the exact same effects as all the these other uh, time dilation blue shifts. You have a universe filled with gravitational waves, and they're all gonna be hitting your planet, and there's nothing you can do about it. And when you get closer and closer to the black hole, those gravitational waves 
are just going to get amplified to higher and higher amplitude, higher and higher frequency, and bombard your planet. Fortunately, unfortunately, this is why it took 100 years to detect them. They're very, even worse than neutrinos, really. They really just fly through everything. So you're going to have to get almost so, well, really so close to that black hole that uh, basically all other bets are off in order for, for, the, black, for the, the gravitational waves to have any real effect on you. So we're going to leave uh, gravitational waves. And I see say, Einstein's Outrageous Legacy. That's the, uh, the subtitle of, of this book that we mentioned before, right? Black Holes and Time Warps, Einstein's Outrageous Legacy. Einstein predicted both black holes and gravitational waves. And we're going to leave it by saying that those gravitational waves might be the only thing that won't kill you around a black hole, which I think is kind of a nice poetic, uh, you know, consistency of, within Einstein's theory. Here are all the things that will kill you. <laughs> all right, we talked about the accretion disk, the sand blasted by an accretion cloud, the cosmic microwave background, the starlight, the neutrinos, dark matter, and maybe or maybe not surrounding gravitational waves. But we want to end on a you know, more positive note. So instead of thinking these things can kill you, right, these are nine ways that a black hole can keep you warm at night. And look for a nice, comfy place to relocate the human race after we've destroyed Earth. Go through the wormhole to Gargantuan and settle down in a nice planet, comfortably in the habitable zone around a supermassive black hole. Thank you very much. Oh, that was so absolutely wonderful. I do know that tonight I'll be going home and treating our Earth just a little bit better because I don't think we'll be going and finding any other place to go to anytime soon. Um, so um, we'd like to, again, thank Dr. Schnittman for um, coming with us today. Um, let's just give it a round just more and more. And we can begin our question and answer period, and we'll ask you to repeat their questions for the purpose of our webcast. And I'll actually put up the, the last slide for those who haven't seen the movie, or more importantly, the people who have seen the movie but maybe were confused about a thing or two. This should clarify everything. <laughs> yeah. So you're assuming in the talk where uh, orbiting something around a black hole is circular or elliptical, but it doesn't move forward, but we know that the gravitational attraction of the black hole is going to pull that planet, exoplanet, whatever, eventually toward it. What's that time frame like? Right. So the, the question was, what's the, the time scale like for the, the planet to actually get pulled into the black hole um, uh, as it spirals in through its orbit? So it's, a, it's actually pretty similar to that of planets in our solar system, right? We go around the sun on circular or elliptical orbits, and we're constantly getting pulled in towards the sun, but we actually don't get really any closer to the sun, and that's because we have angular momentum, right? We, we're, we want to, or sometimes you may learn about it in physics class, as centrifugal force. You kind of want to go out, the sun's pulling you in, and you end up on these nice stable orbits. The one difference with the black hole is you, you also have gravitational waves, which is essentially a, a drag force on the planet. But unless you yourself are also a black hole, that little planet is basically, think of it leave, leaving a wake, right? Um, so a big boat leaves this huge wake and there's a lot of drag on a boat. But uh, you know, a water bug basically just skims across the surface of, of the water. So these little planets that are much, 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 much smaller than the black hole are just like water bugs skimming around the surface of space-time without really any losses at all. The, the bigger problem, again, is due to that, that time dilation, right? Um, factor of 60,000, that planet, even if that planet was kind of created at the beginning of the universe and put next to that black hole by hand, uh, you, you, essentially you take the entire age of the universe, say 13 billion years, divided by 60,000, and you, the planet could really only be 200,000 years old from its point of view, right? The clock on the planet is only 200,000 years old. 
So that's actually another way that it would probably be inhabitable because it takes a while for a planet to really settle into a nice equilibrium before you want to live on it. Other would just be covered with molten rock. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Well, how come, as a, that when, when I first heard of black holes many years ago, I would just have thought that anything around it would have been sucked into it like a sphere. Mm -hmm. But I think we're learning now there's that disk and... Why is it not just pulled in to the center like a severe, like gravity? Well, it, it, the question is, why isn't everything just pulled straight into a black hole? And um, the answer is angular momentum, right? You, the, the, the famous example of angular momentum is the, uh, the ice skater, right? They're spinning around with their arms out. They pull the arms in and they go faster. But if you've ever tried that trick, you actually feel that pull, it wants to pull your arms back out again. So the same with the planet. As it gets closer, it's spinning around, but it has that centrifugal force making it feel like it's trying to pull back out again. And it's the gravity that's pulling it in and it, it just balances. And ex except when you're very, very close to the black hole, they're basically like Newtonian gravity. So it's going to look just like the planets going around the sun in the solar system. We did talk about for the non-spinning black holes or anything that's not comp spinning at the maximum level, you do get to a certain point, and it's very, very close to the black hole, you get to a certain point where you do just fall in. And that's, that's very much a, uh, a relativity prediction. Newtonian, you just get closer and closer, as close as you want to get to a, an infinitely small point. But in, in uh, general relativity, there's this special point beyond which... You're just all, you are going to always just plunge right in, but it's very close to the black hole. Yeah. What's this energy source in relation to radiation levels and in relation to distance from the black hole? You know, like if the sun would get our infinite radiation from the sun, obviously. Right. So the, the question is what's the, the scaling, the relation of energy to distance from the black hole? Um, so if you're far enough away that it just looks like a bright spot in the sky, then it's going to, again, behave just like the sun. The, the flux of energy goes like one over the distance squared. Um, but in some of the ideas that we were showing here, where you're actually in the accretion disk or you're surrounded by this hot matter, then it's going to be more complicated. You're, you know, you, you essentially depends how that temperature in the accretion disk changes as a di as a function of distance. So accretion disk, the temperature typically goes up like one over the distance or something close to that, but then it turns over and it falls off again. So it's, it's not a simple relation unless you're far enough away that it all looks Newtonian. Um, I mean, I've seen press releases okay. from Stephen Hawking, which unfortunately is his primary form of communication yeah. these days. Um, so from a scientific point of view, it's sometimes hard to evaluate the, the details of a, of a press release. Um, from what I understand, though, it's, it, he, I mean, his whole career has really focused on the, the effects of quantum mechanics very close to the horizon of a black hole. Uh, information theory... Where does the quantum uncertainty go? How does it behave around the, hor the horizon? Um, and I've actually, every single effect that I talked about today is purely classical, non-quantum effects involved here. Um, and that's basically my, my research is very much a classical research. So even if Stephen Hawking did write a paper, I'm probably not the one to, uh, okay. to evaluate it. take two. Um, dark matter, I understand, is very hard to measure because it doesn't interact with stuff, but is there some way to get a sense of this to, based on sort of the stability of planets uh, around, and you showed us the microwave background radiation, so we know of the massive stuff that's out there, and we can count black holes and see other stuff moving around. Wouldn't we be able, based on that, to deduce how much black uh, dark matter there has to be in order for this entire system to work. Right, so we, we do measure the total mass in dark matter 
throughout the universe. Um, that's how we know it exists, right? We see how it affects because it affects gravity. So all we have to do is look at orbits around massive things like galaxies and clusters of galaxies. And you can actually see that things, everything is moving faster than it should. So you can essentially work backwards and say, oh, there must be more stuff there. And that's where the whole idea of dark matter came from. Um, when it comes to looking at a, something like a solar, the solar system or, um, or in this case, a, a, a black hole, when you get down to those small scales, the, the whole gravity is dominated so much by the black hole or by the sun that it's very, very hard to measure the, the amount um, of dark matter, right? Near the, in the solar system, there's the equivalent of a single, about one proton per cubic centimeter worth of dark matter, whereas it's something like 10 billion times that much of, of regular matter. So it's, it's very hard to measure on these scales. You have to look on very large scales, not small scales. So we know it exists, we just don't know what it is. Well, we know where it is on a very broad area, you know, over, you know, we know it kind of clumps around galaxies and clusters, but you, you, you can't say, you know, whether it's on the size of a solar system or not. Well, I think we're going to draw this program to a close. Um, and thank you for attending, and we hope to see you at our next program. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.